Hey guys, CJ here with Elevated Systems, and I got a bit of a problem on my hands. My son's gaming PC, the most important part of it, the graphics card, is having some issues. Specifically, the fan on this 2080 Ti has died. Now, normally this would be a simple fix, just replace the fan. But being the tech head that I am, I wanted to try something a little different. I got a bunch of AIO coolers laying around, so I thought I'd try to use one of those NZXT GPU liquid cooler adapters. But as luck would have it, none of my AIOs are compatible. But then I stumbled across something which may be better. The ID Cooling Ice Flow VGA. It's an entire all-in-one liquid cooler for a graphics card. I had never heard of it before, but apparently it's been around for a couple years now. The only other GPU AIOs I was familiar with were the Alpha Cool Ice Wolf series, and those are great, but they're also pretty expensive. The Ice Flow, on the other hand, only costs 99 bucks, so I'd figure I'd give it a try. So in this video, we're gonna unbox the Ice Flow, see what it comes with, go over some of its specs and features, tear down the graphics card, install the AIO, and see how it performs. Now, I do have a few concerns up front that EVGA RTX 2080 Ti Black isn't on the Ice Flow compatibility list, which is weird since it uses the reference PCB. I guess none of the rest will matter if it doesn't fit, so let's just dive in and see what happens. Ice Flow 240 VGA is packaged in non recyclable foam and single use plastics. The first component out of the box is the cooler unit, which is basically just an Asetek style all in one liquid cooler. There's a dual fan aluminum radiator measuring 285 by 120 by 30 millimeters, 38 millimeter tubes connect it to a standard pump block with copper cold plate. Attached to the pump is a metal shroud which houses a 92 millimeter ARGB fan with a rated speed of 800 to 2500 RPM and a maximum airflow of 44.3 cubic feet per minute. The radiator fan is a single dual fan unit measuring 245 by 120 by 27 millimeters. The fans have a rated speed of 900 to 2000 RPM and a max airflow of 56.5 cubic feet per minute. All the fans use standard 4-pin PWM connectors and standard 3-pin ARGB cables. The hardware includes mounting brackets for multiple card generations as you see here. However, as we'll see, the mounting hole spacing is more important here. There are the required mounting screws for the water block as well as the fans and radiator and heat sinks and thermal tape for the VRM and MOSFETs. Also included are fan and ARGB splitter cables and an optional SATA powered RGB controller. After removing the old cooler with its broken fan from the RTX 2080 Ti, the first thing I did was measure the distance between the mounting holes. Quick tip, to accurately measure the center point of two holes with a digital caliper, first open the calipers to the diameter of the hole and zero the caliper. Now measure from the outside edge of the two holes and because of the negative offset, we have the center to center measurement of 52.5 millimeters. And right off the bat, I can see that this isn't even close to the 70.5 millimeters of the RTX 20 series brackets. This review could end right here, but the 53.3 millimeter RX 200 series bracket is really close. With 1.5 millimeter mounting screws and three millimeter holes, I do have a few millimeters of tolerance after all. And with a quick eyeball, it looks like it lines up. So I screwed the brackets to the pump block. Now the stock back and mid plates of the EVGA card are basically big heat spreaders and work well cooling the VRAM and other components. So I wanted to keep those. So I need to do a fit test to ensure nothing interfered with the cooler mount. So I put a blob of the included thermal paste on the GPU die and screwed the card to the cooler and tightened it down. I also took this time to adjust the pump cover and check my clearances. After I had it tightened down, I unscrewed and removed it and checked the paste and I see I have a really nice spread and a good mount. Now it's time to add some heat sinks to the card, however almost everything that needs them is covered with the mid plate. Now, other than the GPU die, the MOSFETs on the left and right of the die are the only points the old cooler contacted. So those are the points I'm adding the heat sinks to. Now I'm cheating a little. I used the included sinks for the exposed MOS, but I used some larger ones I had on hand on top of the aluminum plate over the VRM on the right. In fact, because the power delivery on the left doesn't get much, if any of the airflow from the fans, I'll end up ordering a larger heat sink for that. But with those secured, I 
cheated a little again and used some Thermal Grizzly Cryonaut for the final installation and screwed the card to the cooler again. Finally, I screwed the dual fan unit to the radiator in a pole config because I just finished filming my review of the Height Y40 and it'll be a great system to install and test the hopefully fixed and improved RTX 2080 Ti. Well, the installation was a breeze. I was worried it might not be compatible, but it turns out that wasn't an issue. Now, I'm assuming the compatibility list is based on cards that ID cooling physically validated and meets every parameter exactly, but I did notice that some power delivery is on the left side of the GPU die away from the fan's airflow, which probably kept this card off the list. But my next concern is fan control. I have the pump block plugged into the motherboard pump header with the CPU cooler pump block, and I have the fans plugged into a system fan header. But this motherboard, like most, doesn't have access to GPU temps in the UEFI, so you can't select the GPU as the temperature source to control the fan speeds. So if you use CPU temps when the GPU temps spike, your fans won't because in a lot of games, CPU usage can be really low while GPU usage is at or near 100%. Now, there are third-party software and hubs that work for this, but I've got a couple solutions for you. First option, find a fan speed that balances a GPU temperature and fan noise level that you're comfortable with and just set it at that as your fan speed. Another option is to spend some time in the games you normally play and keep track of the CPU temps when your GPU is at high load and use those CPU temps as your fan curve points. I've done this with custom water-cooled systems. I'd record CPU temps at system idle and set that temp as a low RPM. And once it went over the idle range, it meant I was gaming. So I set the fan speeds to ramp to about 80% or higher. For testing, I'll be setting the fans to 100%, but when I reinstall it back in my sun system, I'll be using the thermal couple you might have seen stuck to the side of the GPU die. Luckily, his ASUS ROG motherboard has a temp sensor header I can plug that into and use that as the temperature source for the fan curve. I just need to determine the offset of that sensor to the GPU die temp and use that offset temp to dial in a fan curve that balances temps with noise. Now, unfortunately, I can't do a direct apples to apples before and after test because the before card was broke, but I've had this card for almost five years, so I'm very familiar with it. I know overclocked, fans maxed, and in a Meshify 2, the card hit between 83 and 85 degrees Celsius in Time Spy Extreme. So I dialed in the same overclock, and after looping Time Spy Extreme graphics test for 20 minutes, the GPU maxed out at just 54 degrees. The GPU hotspot only hit 68.1 degrees. That's a 30 degree drop over the old cooler. Now, I knew the temps would be better, but that's equivalent to a full custom loops I've built and at a fraction of the price. With that, I could call this an absolutely perfect product. Unfortunately, there's a huge discrepancy in the product description and instructions. ID cooling clearly shows and describes the pump as being located in the radiator. And because of that says you can install the radiator at the bottom of the case under the GPU, but it's not, and you absolutely shouldn't. The pump is very obviously in the pump block that's installed on the GPU, just like a normal AIO. The pump power cable goes into the pump block. There is no power going into the radiator. There's no pump in the radiator. Therefore, if you install the radiator below the GPU, the pump will be the absolute highest point in the loop. And everyone's familiar with the Gamers Nexus video. Most people misunderstood it, but pump on top is worst case. All the air in the loop will rise to the pump and the pump will fail eventually, maybe. So regardless of what the directions say, don't do that. Other than that, you can install it anyway, on the front or on the side of the case, on top, tubes up, tubes down, doesn't matter. However, the other issue I have is the tubes seem a little short at just 38 millimeters. It may not reach the front of some cases in situations where you need to install it with the tubes up. For those who's wondering why you might need to do that, there are a lot of cases where the radiator won't fit tubes down because there's a shroud or drive cages or both in the way. All right, guys, let's wrap this up. So yeah, the product description was a bit sketchy and that's bad, especially in terms of customer trust, but that's not gonna stop me from saying that the Iceflow 240 VGA is a solid choice and possibly the only choice for a GPU AIO. 
It's easy to install, great price point, and the performance is off the charts. I saw a 30 degree drop in temps, which means more overclocking headroom, and that's always a good thing. Now, I need to put this bad boy back in my son's gaming rig, but honestly, it looks too good in this Y40K, so I'm thinking about transferring his system into it, but that's a story for another day, so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that episode. In the meantime, hit me up with any questions about the ID Cooling Ice Flow 240 VGA in the comment section, and don't forget to give this video a like, and I'll catch you in the next one.